room talking about the state of the capital markets. My name is Peter Klinger. I'm the Director of Investor Relations at Cannings Purple, uh, Perth's uh, leading strategic communications firm. And I'm delighted to be here today and delighted to have a, a really great lineup of panelists. So joining us today and a very warm welcome to Matt Gill, Managing Director at White, White Rock Minerals. Uh, White Rock's just raised 7.35 million to advance its exciting last chance gold prospect in Alaska, not far from Northern Star's Pogo mine. Liam Twigger, the founder and managing director of PCF Capital, leading corporate advisory firm from London. A very, very early good morning to Alistair Clayton, executive director of Pilbara Gold and Copper Explorer Artemis Resources, who shares, by the way, are at a 15 month high. So you're obviously doing some good work there, Alistair. And last and certainly not least, uh, from the boardroom at Leading Perth Brokerage Hartleys, in Parker, the executive chairman. Um, thank you all for joining us and thank you to the participants for logging in online. There will be a question and answer time uh, afterwards, so please uh, come up with your questions, submit them online and we'll get to as many as we can later on. In Parker, if I can start with uh, you maybe, uh, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, yet our share market's on a, on a tear. I mean, the recovery from those COVID sell-offs uh, seems to be uh, have been quite remarkable. Is this a false dawn or, or are the, the recovery signs um, at the fundamentals quite strong? Yeah, well, that's the, the million dollar question. The, the, uh, the big debate happening worldwide is are we going to see a, a V-shaped recovery or a W-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery? Uh, obviously, the market bottomed out on the 23rd of March, was that, which was that Monday after, certainly in Australia, we had all the shutdowns and um, there was really panic. There was a whole lot of redemptions happening from ETFs, uh, people thinking that uh, super funds were going to um, run into financial trouble. There was, there was real panic. And then the, the recovery since then has been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, I've got to say, having been an observer of markets for um, well over 30 years, uh, it has surprised me as to how quickly it's recovered. Uh, I think there's a number of factors there. Uh, one of the, the things is that there's not much else to do with your money at the moment. Interest rates are at a historical low. Certainly in Australia, the property market looks you know, nearly as, as shaky as what the share market potentially is. Uh, there's a lot of liquidity in the system, and which has been created by the government. So, so the injection that the government has put in to markets has sort of outweighed, at, for the moment, the, the potential economic shock of the pandemic. Um, you've also had commodity prices go pretty well. I mean, the gold price, I think, today, it's, a, it's a, has hit a, um, I don't know if it's an all, I think it's an all-time high, certainly in Aussie dollar terms, you know, around $2,500, $2,600 an ounce. So um, nickel's back in fashion. There's a whole lot of areas that are, that are really good. So combined with liquidity, government injections, and maybe misplaced optimism, uh, that, that's what's um, caused this market rally. Alistair, what's the view from London? Um, yeah, when you look at the macro picture there. Yeah, look, look, I'd, I'd echo Ian's comments there. I suppose I'd hone in on one or two that I think are pretty, pretty salient here. You know, in terms of liquidity, we're clearly seeing a, a whole lot of water poured on the roof, and it's starting to fill the gutters and flow down various drain pipes of investment, for want of a better analogy. But look. We're still probably a couple of weeks behind you guys. Uh, you probably heard the monumental news that pubs are reopening in uh, 10 days' time, etc. But look, you know, I, th I think it's certainly masking the big question that I think we're all really asking is, is, is what happens when the government sort of furlough scheme, as they call it here, really stops? What, what's going to happen on Main Street, the real economy? To some degree, uh, you know, while we're all market participants, I think there's uh, some, you know, some degree just to ignore that for the minute. Uh, potentially as a as as a symptom and not a cause, and I think we're all really waiting for bated breath. What happens out there on the high street? Uh, are these businesses really reopening? How long will they last without government money? So yeah, I think uh, I think we're about two or three weeks behind you guys to really start to get some some, some a clear view on that. And I'll get on to Matt in a minute because he's just raised money. But Liam, you have a lot of ties into the North American market. What sort of the perspective or the feedback you're getting from those markets? Oh, look, it's, it, it's still pretty tough. It, it is an amazing thing. I guess the only thing to compare this crisis with is maybe the GFC. And whilst the impact is probably 10 times greater, the GFC actually took 70 weeks for the market to bottom up following the GFC. 
and they, it was down 50%. This is like 10 times bigger. The market bottomed within four weeks and it was only down 30%. So the bounce back has been amazing. The question is whether we've seen the bottom, and I noted that in, in maybe Ian's sentiment, but have we seen the bottom? I'm not sure, but there certainly is a wall of money, but I don't think it's looking for high risk ventures. They're looking for um, high probability opportunities, people that, that have an existing resource, extending it, um, and they love gold. So gold and, and maybe nickel. Um, and if you've got a good sales pitch, and Matt raising that money recently was fabulous, and he's <laughs> worn out a lot of shoe leather over the years, and uh, to pull off the deal that he's done is nothing sort of spectacular. Well, may we, I mean, t take us through that, Matt, because indeed, as Liam alluded to, you've only just raised money, and it is gold, and it is in a, in a pretty exciting part of the world uh, in, in Alaska. But what was sort of the, the and, and you were very su successful, probably raised more than I, I would dare suggest you, you, you thought you would raise. What, what was the overarching sort of feedback from existing and new investors about their sort of appetite? Yeah, look, that's a good question, Peter. It was bizarre, was probably the best way of describing this raising. You know, uh, Rowan Wallen and I, and Leon knows the story, we set out at PDAC back in March looking to raise $2 million. Um, Roll the clock forward, you know, we could have raised 10 on this story. Uh, and to think that we raised our market cap, so $7 million, uh, on a gold stream sediment anomaly in central Alaska, and I'm mining it, is nothing short of, of bizarre. Um, we had a cornerstone groundswell of, of interest in the story from technical business manager geologist types. It wasn't a retail story, too early for funds. So we needed to target the audience with the story. That was critical. Um, but what, what really crystallised it was we tapped this North American interest. Um, so half the money we raised came out of North America. Um, and at the end of the raising, 20% of our register will now be North American. So while Liam says it is tough in North America, I can only, it only reinforces that, you know, good projects should be able to find funding no matter where it is within reason and the exchange you're on. But yeah, the, 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 the psychology, I, I think if I took a step back, we just picked gold at the right time, right commodity. Um, COVID, I think, has given people a lot of spare time and, and thinking and exactly what do you do with your money? There aren't many places to put money. Um, and then you overlay COVID and risk and gold and trade wars, and it was almost the perfect storm for us. So Matt, you're based in Melbourne, the projects in uh, in Alaska and a lot of the in investor support came from North America. Alistair, you're in London, you've got a near-term gold development project to south of Karatha or, and and of course uh, a really exciting sort of exploration prospect in the Patterson um, mm -hmm. province. H how, how do we, in, in this new world, uh, Matt, you touched on uh, this all started at PDAC, back when we could still meet face to face. In this new world on, on, you know, on Zoom conferences, how are you guys explaining your stories to investors and, and how have you sort of adapted? Maybe I'll start with you, Alistair. Yeah, sure. Look, we've all become, well, here we are. You know, we've all become Zoom experts, haven't we? But I'll I, I tell you what's interesting and maybe sort of grabbing on some of what Matt just said there. I mean, the, the, the interest coming out in terms of you've got lots of family offices, et cetera, especially in Europe, a lot of sort of old money really starting to rear its head, which would traditionally be, you know, retail, commercial, real estate, et cetera, those sort of plays in terms of wealth preservation. They're really coming into the gold market looking for investment opportunities, of which, to be frank, you know, AIM is quite skinny on those. So sort of getting to your point, um, look, we're all managing Zoom pretty well. I was on a call last night with a Swiss family office. We had a fund manager in Budapest who runs a couple of billion dollars, um, you know, for smaller market cap, someone I'd never heard of before. Uh, mate, and then, you know, we had someone in Tulsa, you know, and I suppose, uh, you know, we all like to, to get on a plane and travel and, and do these things face to face. And I, I, I'm not a believer that that kind of element of the business is going to change. I think as and when we will still do the face to face stuff, but it's certainly allowed for very rapid uh, ability to get into areas of the capital markets that we've probably traditionally haven't seen. So in that respect, Peter, I think it's been a, you know, a positive. Ian Parker, I mean, yeah. you, you know, Hartley's got one of the, the biggest dealing desks in, in Perth, if not the biggest. H how have you guys, you know, adjusted to it? And it's not from, I mean, we can all present on Zoom, but from a due diligence point of view, from an investment sort of assessment point of view, what, how has that sort of changed your, your, your thinking, your approach? 
Um, well, our office stayed open, so we were deemed an essential service, apparently, like a bank. I don't, I don't know if stockbrokers are an essential service, but that's <laughs> what we were. Um, Enjoy so, it while you can, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> we had 20 odd people here the whole time. A lot of our, our dealers are working from home. You got they got used to WebEx meetings and Zoom meetings reasonably quickly. Um, WA was a bit different as well because WA we just never had the really severe restrictions that have happened in other places in the world. So it was easier to do business here. We could still meet with people, not in the office, but outside of the office. Um, and, you know, in fact, there was a, a massive surge in retail accounts. It was quite extraordinary. Um, we, we don't deal in obviously the online type sector, but uh, I know the online brokers were opening up thousands of new accounts. Um, and even at, at our level, we were opening up, you know, a lot of people were, were calling to open up uh, new accounts because they'd been sitting in cash, they saw the share market fall 30%, they'd been wanting to have shares for a long time, and literally they were calling up and saying, can we open an account? And I think, uh, I'm a, a lot, little bit different to Liam now, I actually think the appetite for risk at the moment is enormous. I, I, I think I've never seen an appetite for risk like this. It's a worrying appetite for risk. You know, the the the, the placements that have been able to get away, and uh, the, the companies that are the, the quality and quantity of uh, capital raisings, or certainly the quantity of capital raisings, is extraordinary. You know, it, it uh, so the the appetite for risk um, is we we sort of open up a, a raising and you you're buried in applications within half a day and you've, and you've got to close it off. Um, we're not doing large ones, but um, you know, the, the, there's, there's a real demand. And I think um, this whole, there's a lot of people still very underinvested in our resource sector. I really believe that there's a lot of big funds, a lot of these family offices that Alice here was talking about, they don't, they don't have much money in the sector and they're trying to work out how they're going to be part of it. Um, so it's a, I know I'm talking a book, but it's a pretty exciting time for, Western Australia for the resources sector um, in general. And just a reminder just to, to sorry, Peter. Yeah, I was, I was going to get on to you, Liam, and just say from a from a deal point of view, then you know how, how does that sort of risk appetite? How does that sort of, if I can call the flood of investment or that that interest? How does that sort of translate? Because we, we're already seeing deals being done in the gold sector. Certainly, there's sort of that reshuffling or refocusing of portfolios. Um, you know, we've talked about sort of some of the other commodities are starting to look good again. How, you know, where, where are we at in that corporate sort of transaction stage or timeline? Well, just following on from Ian and, and I guess reflecting on the appetite for risk, I mean, sold gold, I'm, I'm on that board, but I mean, we raised plus $30 million. You've got the CEO in Brisbane, we've got the management team in London, project in, in Ecuador, and also have a, a Toronto listing. And that, that went really well. So, and there was, obviously no site visits there. And we've got a big financing with Franco there that uh, we've got to sort of manage that due diligence when you can't get into country. So, but, you know, the risk appetite has has improved dramatically. Um, there's a lot of a lot of good transactions out there, both corporate and at the project level. But I, whilst there's money for a good story, and that's, you know, testament to that, you know, sensational capital raising um, and Alistair too, I tend to think when I looked at the money that was raised in Western Australia or raised in on, on the ASX for resource companies of the last sort of 12 months, the echo from most of the companies are the sort of the Bellevue's, even Genesis this morning, the Red Fives, they tend to be more around um, established projects or where, where you know, that the, the risk isn't as great as uh, in terms of a wildcat hole. Now, there's still good money for a wildcat hole, I guess, but not as much. And, uh, and also the other reflection is the lack of IPOs which is the true ultimate pump money, and we haven't seen many of those. So that market's yet to turn on, but uh, good management teams and good projects can certainly raise money, and we're seeing a bit more corporate activity as well. What, what's happening with the IPO market, Liam? I mean, do you think it's just waiting to get going, or what are, uh, and maybe it's also a question for Ian, what, what are the punters looking for to give IPO prospects the opportunity to go and, 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 and list? I'll, maybe if I could jump in and then pass to Ian, but there's a lot of zombie juniors at the moment with next to no cash and uh, looking for, for opportunities. And uh, the success of IPOs hasn't been great. So I and, and I don't think the ASX is necessary. You know, the, 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 the hurdle that they've got to allow people on is getting higher and it's pretty tough. At the, at the real small end, it's as hard as it's ever been. So um, I don't hold um, sort of huge hopes 
um, in the near term for sort of juniors raising five million bucks. I think you need to have more meat on the bone than that, but happy to get Ian's thoughts. Um, yeah, well, if I cut in the, um, to do an IPO, to do a small IPO is really quite difficult and really quite expensive, both for the broker and for the company. Um, it's much more efficient for the brokers to do placements in existing companies, to do mergers and things. Small IPOs, the ASX has made it so hard, so expensive, and the, um, the compliance costs and things, you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars before you put even one drill hole in. So it's not a really very efficient way to do it anymore. And, and to be perfectly honest, you know, brokers don't get paid all that well for, for IPOs. And as Liam said, they haven't been all that successful. That will be the sign when you see a whole lot of IPOs, my slightly cynical brain says, <laughs> when we see all these IPOs coming out, be a bit careful because that's a sign that we're getting really toppy. You know, when you see a nice expiration IPO come on, the 20 cent IPO come on at 50 cents, you're going to say, uh oh, this is overheated. So while we think, well, I think it's a bit overheated now, we're going to look back over previous booms and think, well, maybe I'm too conservative. I don't know if it is overheated yet. We haven't had that real blow off that you get in these bull markets. I vividly remember the last gold boom back in the early 90s. So stocks went up tenfold. So if we think that, again, I'm sounding a bit bullish, but if we think that, you know, this is, uh, this is a little too hot, go back and look at history. You know, this, this can go a lot higher. That, that blow off phase, I don't think has happened yet. So that, that is a billion dollar question. And maybe Matt, seeing that you've just raised money, is, you know, is the gold stock, a gold sector uh, from top to bottom, bottom to top, starting to look a little bit frothy? Look, that's a good question. I think there's two camps. Liam probably agree as well. You know, there are the producers and, um, you know, what you'd give to be a producer, um, you know, with your current Aussie Australian gold price. And then there's the rest. And um, the rest is in two parts. One of the near term developers and we've got a project in New South Wales that struggles in that near term development. So we're not enjoying production um, and we don't have the sizzle of expiration. Um, with the New South Wales asset, and then there are the explorers. And I think I think the market is rewarding explorers and results. You know, you can rattle off chalice, um, rocks. I mean, there's a whole bunch of guys that are putting out right. results and, and the market is recognising it. And that a year ago, I don't think was happening. Um, so I, I don't think it's frothy, but I'm a mining engineer, what would I know? Um, I just Much about froth. <laughs> Uh, I'm a red wine man. Um, I, I just think that the market and finally the juniors are getting some of the love. You know, the, they talk about, you know, the trickle down, you know, if you're well invested in the producers, well, where do you next go? Um, I'd like to think that's happening. I don't know, but I think some explorers are getting the benefit. We're, we're a beneficiary of, of a story that's got the sizzle and the potential. Um, and, and there are others that I've mentioned out there. So, I, I don't think it's overheated. I think, um, you know, gold always has its moments and it's it's one of those moments on a general, you know, over decades upward trend. Alistair, Artemis got a, um, a prize tenement in the in the Patterson. Funnily enough, from the ASX sort of point of view, we, we think of the Patterson and uh, Rio's great success with Winu. And, and Rio is, of course, not an exploration stock. Yet here you are in London, and Greatland Gold has probably done more for the exploration focus and success on exploration focus in Patterson than uh, than any other stock. But it's listed in in, in the UK. Well, what, what sort of the, the has that done anything to the sentiment among investors in the UK around exploration and also an appetite for exploration rather than just having to chase cash flow? Yeah, sure. Look again, you know, I'd echo the sentiments of Matt and the other guys in terms of sort of from sort of you know, looking at 20,000 feet. In terms of your sort of question, I mean, some interesting stories. You know, we were lucky enough, I, I run an investment company that invests in companies as well, a uh, listed investment company, and Greatland was our only mining stock. So, you know, happy days. But yeah, look, talking to the to the team at Greatland over the last two years, I mean, I guess the, you know, the, the appetite for explorers uh, from a sort of more institutional perspective has been non-existent. Um, simply, you know, there's been such a, uh, like sort of washing liquid on a, on a greasy pan, you know, you've got small retail high net worth, you've got, uh, 
your black rocks and there's just nothing in between anymore. Um, and I know that that's a trend around the world, but I think it's very, very exacerbated in the UK. You've just got those two diametrically opposed investor groups. And, and Greatland's journey, and I'm sure Gervais and, and Callum won't mind me saying, you know, has been one of presenting some fabulous results just with no institutional flow through. And from, from memory, they still do not, for a company with a 500 million mark, pound market cap, they still do not have a single TR1, which is quite remarkable, really, when you consider the nature of the project with Newcrest, et cetera. So, that, you know, in terms of sort of interest, yes, it has, Peter. You're seeing retail interest and you're starting to see high net worth family office interest. But as far as one can tell from... Uh, you know, walking around the city uh, here, uh, you, you don't see anything on the institutional side. I think they they won't touch anything pre-resource, regardless of what homework you handed. Can I just uh, encourage everyone who's got a question online to submit their questions um, uh, so we can make sure we get to your questions before the end of the panel. But uh, Alistair, if I can just sort of segue that into, into Liam, because it gets to that, almost that uh, sort of, you know, big picture question. Um, the value of exploration. I mean, I, I, it's very easy for us sitting here in Perth to say so little money being spent on exploration in the scheme of things. Certainly, greenfields, nothing's being found. Yeah, at, at what's the, where are we going to get these these next uh, uh, you know, deposits of gold and nickel and and copper, or is this just going to trigger that M and A sort of consolidation or phase that Liam you've you know quite often sort of anticipated and hasn't hasn't quite happened yet. Well, it's, it's certainly been cheaper to buy a project than it is to discover an ounce. And we've looked at those metrics over the years, the last 20 years, when you look at the billions that have been spent on exploration and very little return versus buying an ounce, a project at 30 bucks an ounce. We just saw that uh, deal by Genesis this morning, buying a Kukani for around $30 an ounce, which is a lot cheaper than, you know, from trying to find it yourself. So I think we'll, we'll ultimately pay the cost of not um, exploring and not investing in exploration, but certainly you do get the rewards, but it's after the events. The Chalice has had a fabulous run and, and, uh, and it's been an inspiration. It was after the event. Um, in terms of saying, I'm going to punt to try and find a project like that up at Julemar, um, people would have told you to go and you know, tell your story walking. So after the event, yeah, there's a bit more excitement. So I still think it's so there's there's more value and more interest buying existing projects. And I do think on the M and A side, people are trading the earnings multiple. And you know, if you're a two hundred thousand ounce producer, you trade it four times. If you're a three hundred thousand ounce producer, it's six times. And if you're a five hundred thousand ounce producer, you trade it eleven times. And it's just making those consolidations. You can see that happening right in front of us with the Australian market, with guys positioning themselves to make strategic acquisitions to get up onto the radar of the next level of funds and get sort of brought up because, uh, you know, the, the valuation multiples are, are fabulous. Liam, do you think that the Australian gold sector or that the guys who are over here, not, not all of them ASX listed, um, including some from foreign listings, do, do you think we'll see another big wave of a sort of portfolio adjusting and, and right sizing? I mean, we saw... Um, Evolution spin off Krakow to Eris, and of course, Shandong's now picked up Cardinal. Um, do, do, do you expect more of that as, as we see that portfolio adjustment? Well, look, look I'm going to segue that. Look, Shandong picking up Cardinal, that's subject to Perth, and uh, that's a big issue um, with any of the dealings that you've got now in the Australian market. Uh, and Ferb are putting the handbrake on a whole number of deals. I mean, Hank King have made that pitch for Gascoigne. That looks terrific, but that's going to require Ferb. Northern Minerals got their deal knocked back by Ferb. So, Ferb has been brought in by the Australian government to try and protect the market from opportunism. But I don't think we're seeing any of that. We're just seeing a pile of mud being applied to, to uh, force companies to wade through to get deals uh, done. But uh, so, so, so Ferb is a massive and growing issue and needs to be addressed because unfortunately they report to no one. I mean, Ferb says no, or so we need another six months. There's nothing you can do. And it's, a, it's an issue for the sector. It's stopping jobs and capital being deployed. But uh, in, in going back to your question, in terms of uh, further, it, it's, I love the evolution model with saying you need six to eight projects and any more than that, it gets too hard. And they're very disciplined, aren't they, in terms of how they grow and then drop projects off. And it's probably a good model for everyone else to look at. So I think there'll be you know, opportunities coming down and there'll be more of the crack house out there. You touched on fur, maybe I can get Matt's sort of view. Um, I mean, we saw this certainly during the GFC that, um, you know, the, the resources sector by and large survived on foreign investment. You've just talked about how much foreign investment support you got. Now, I know it's not, it's from North America, not necessarily the target of, of the FERB restrictions, but how important is it? it is, you know, just remind us again how important foreign investment is in the Australian resources sector. 
So look, yeah, I can just talk from our experience. I, I was previously uh, managing director of Castlemaine Goldfield. So two, two AFX listed school juniors, both had big overseas components in their register. Um, both had chunks out of Asia, predominantly Hong Kong and Singapore, because the, I found that over time, you know, the appetite out of certainly Hong Kong for gold and silver that doesn't need a dork um, and doesn't need an MPV and doesn't need a 10 year mine life in a spreadsheet um, it ha ha has been a good hunting ground for me in both those companies. Um, we've also got the North American component that I mentioned. Um, when I was Castlewain Goldfields, we did have a chunk out of London, but that's I found that now in the White Rock scenario, probably the hardest place to find capital to um, to Alistair's point. Yep. Um, you know, so I still work um, Australia. You know, we often look overseas at someone else's backyard, but you know, we should never forget there is a pretty good investment appetite in Australia. I think uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. Singapore is underrated. It's very conservative, but once you scratch the surface of money available in Singapore, you'd be surprised. And and I am still getting over the surprise of how much money we got out of North America and the US in particular. The US is a bit of a challenge for an ASX listed company in the securities exchange. Uh, and to Alice's point, you know, you don't find many of these in the yellow pages. You know, they're not obvious. The, 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 the middle group funds, you know, not the retail and not the big guys, but they are there. But boy, it's who you know, um, not what you read and not what you see. So I, th I think a spread in your register is important, Peter. And what are your thoughts on uh, on the importance of sort of foreign investment? I know you guys are a you know, dominant broking house in Perth, but it's, um, you know, it, it is a global pool of money, isn't it? Oh, it's very much a global pool of money. And look, I mean, disclaimer, we, we're actually acting for Cardinal in that uh, takeover. So, uh, but I mean- Disclaimer, so are we. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not a good, uh, expert, but that project's in Ghana. It's not in Australia. So it's, it's an Australian company mine done. I, I don't know whether, um, as I say, I don't know whether Fleur looks at that. Um, but the overseas money is just essential. There's just not enough money from Australian institutions to fund these things. So if we want Australian companies doing projects, I mean, a lot of our clients are running projects in, in Africa, not just Ghana, but Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, some countries are kind of pronounced and certainly never going to go to. Um, but um, yeah, so that, that overseas money is essential. So you would hope that common sense prevails with with food, but then you know it is a government organisation, so does common common sense always prevail? I don't know. Um, I just say I'm not an expert on that. But your question, overseas money, essential to uh, to our um, to our sector. We've had a, a good question come through from the audience. Um, Australia has been relatively lucky with regard to COVID nineteen. Is the panel seeing this play out in terms of a preference? for raising Australian projects. And I think if we look at what's happening in the US, I think Canada's probably all right, but the US and notwithstanding Alistair that you can go to the pub again soon, um, there's still some big concerns about the UK. But do, do you think, and maybe I can start with Liam, do you think that we can use our relative success with the exception of Victoria to, um, you know, as a, you know, to attract more capital? Look, absolutely. It's, it's fabulous. We're going to be the first ones out of the blocks. We seem to have it under control, albeit maybe Victoria's still got a, a bit of work to do. So we're in a very good position. But we're, we're involved in a couple of deals in South Africa, of all places. But it seems to me businesses are going, learning to live with the virus. They're sort of saying, well, OK, this isn't going to go away. We should get a vaccine at some point, but we can work around this. So you just got to manage the supply line. So I think we're first out of the blocks and we're, and we're going to do very well. And there is an attraction, but I think the markets and, and, and capital being the way it is, they'll work around how to get around this virus. Alistair, I mean, you've um, you know got, got many interests, but Artemis being in, in WA, has, has that sort of cropped up in, in conversation at all with investors that, oh, thank God you're in WA, it's relatively safe or? Oh, yeah, look, I mean, the short answer is yes, Peter, but I, I, I think I can't think of a time in the last 25 years where I wouldn't answer yes to that question, mm. despite you know, things that have gone on uh, to the contrary. I think I think the biggest swing we're seeing in terms of people's willingness and desire to invest in Western Australia, maybe, you know, Australia as a whole, is they're far more 
uh, far more or less concerned about taking dollar risk, which was one of the key ones that we always saw, you know, when we did some large yeah. transactions, uh, you know, back in the, you know, 2012 before, you know, the dollar exposure was always what they worried about predominantly. But in terms of sort of, uh, in, in terms of COVID, look, no doubt, absolutely no doubt that, and, and people look, you know, Mark McGowan might not be my political cup of tea, but you know, they should be, should be congratulated for the way that they've, they've held the industry up and he's been prepared to take a little bit of flack to keep, to keep, keep everything running. So yeah, absolutely. Alistair, I'll pass on your congratulations to the WA Premier. We've got time for <laughs> one more question um, and I'll direct it at Matt maybe. Uh, and we've touched on this a little bit. Given the multiple uplift of building more ounces, why aren't more companies and corporate advisors actively partnering up? Now, I know you've got some way to go with last chance, Matt, but uh, is, that, is that something that's uh, on your on your radar, so to speak? Yeah, look, absolutely. It's a bit like, you know, your source of funding, you know, in, in terms of uh, globally that we touched on, um, you know, just to remind the audience. So we did enter into a joint venture on our Alaskan asset with Sandfire Resources. Um, you know, that was a $20 million stage one program. Um, we, we worked with them last year, spent 8 million um, in joint venture. Uh, they were buying mod resources, so we withdrew this year. Um, but, you know, they're back again. They, they're actually participating in this current raising. So the model of a junior and a major, I think, is smart. Um, you know, juniors are nimble and focused and live and breathe the rocks and the drilling that we do. Um, the majors are often busy and maybe a little bit of inertia in corporate. And I, and I say that with respect, having worked in big companies. So the idea of tapping the balance sheet of a major and working together to fund a junior, I, I think is a really, really smart model in the current environment, especially when, you know, finding funding directly for a junior can be tough. Um, so I, I think that is a very important model and there should be more of that, to, to be honest. And how does that sort of sit from an investment and uh, I suppose investment appetite and risk point of view, that model? Oh, yeah, it's a great model. Um, the, the juniors have, um, they can just do things much cheaper than the majors. And you've just seen, I think it was a, another little consolidation here with that Cassini, you know, Oz Minerals, did a, they had Cassini doing all their sort of development and, and exploration. They sort of, I think they had 30% or something. And then they said, okay, that's good. If you've gone far enough, now we'll take you over. Um, great model for um, both us in the smaller end and uh, I assume for the, for the majors because they can have other people doing all their little exploration. If it doesn't work, it, it's cost them a lot less than if they had to go out and try and do that themselves. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a good model and I think it'll, it'll continue, to, um, continue to grow. Fantastic, thanks gentlemen. Time is up, but before it, we, we sign off, can I just go around the table and just ask you all, where's gold, Aussie gold gonna be at the end of the year? Liam? Uh, 3,000 bucks. Now, Alistair? Yeah, I'd, I'd go with Liam on that, 3,000. Matt? I'll sleep happily if it stays at 2,500. <laughs> Ian? I always reckon if everybody thinks the same thing, the opposite is going to happen, you know, but uh, um, I'll, go, I'll go high field here, yeah, plus 3,000. <laughs> but uh, Fantastic. Very, very brave trying to predict things. <laughs> Toss a coin. Fantastic. Ian Parker at Hartley, Liam Twig at PCF, Alistair Clayton in London at Artemis Resources and Matt Gill at White Rock. Many thanks.